Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. So glad to have you with us on this Tuesday morning. Are you live, alert, awake, and enthusiastic, Tobin? Oh, are we waking up yet? Is yeah, this all a dream? <laughs> You know, most of the time when we get up okay. I mean, you know, it's fine. It's just the normal routine of things. This morning seemed a little ho- a little tougher. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, I hate those mornings when that happens, but the alarm went off, and it felt like a knife stabbing me through the eye. <laughs> you know, I mean, I like <laughs> slammed my hand down on my alarm, and then it, it set for a five minutes to repeat, you know, and when the second one went off, I jumped out of bed, like, just, like, angry. Angry. Arr! Like the Hulk. Right? You don't like me when I'm angry. Exactly. Uh, but, you know, like having taken the shower helped. It kind of, you know, get that water splashing on you, kind of wakes you up a little bit. But, man, is it tough to get up some days. Yeah, it totally is. But it's going to be a beautiful day. I mean, we have yeah. this gorgeous spring weather all week long. I think, you know, it's supposed to be between like 74 and 81 all week long. Yes. And, and I'm planning to try to get back to running today. So, it, you know, after the, the kids leave, I'm going to, I haven't run for a while. I, I had an injury back in uh, February, and then we had our vacation, and I got sick, and just a variety of things happened. And so I haven't really been running as much as I used to, and it's, it's hard. You've got to get back into that Well, and let's be routine. honest. What did we do when we were on vacation? I mean, more than anything, more than the sights, more than we the... We ate. We ate, yes. <laughs> and we drank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is what you do when you travel. You yes, know? and uh, it was great. Yeah. Oh, but you know everything's tighter. I put on a uh, a pair of my dress trousers, my dress pants today, and it was like, oh, this is a little snugger. Then I like it. Yes. So yeah, so we're back to back to you know got to eat right, got to drink lots of water, which is something I forget to do. Yeah, I really do. Well, you know they say you're supposed to drink like a gallon or so a day, and I never make that that ridiculous amount. And, and I think I'm better than I used to be, especially with the running. I've had to become better at it. But on a regular day, I drink two 16-ounce bottles of water during the day, and then I'll have glasses of water at home. So I'm at least 32 ounces or more a day. I am not. Like, I should have had water last night for dinner. Yeah. I had a beer. Ooh. But, you know. Um, Party at the Brinker House. <laughs> I had a beer. <laughs> But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm bad about it. You know, my kidneys are going to jump out of my body and run away screaming. Yeah. I need water. No, and water, and water is such a key to everything because if you're drinking a lot of water, it actually fills up your stomach so you don't feel as hungry, so you're going to eat less. Um, it also, because it keeps you hydrated so well, um, uh, everything flows better. I'm trying to be polite about how I say that, but everything flows better. Yeah, I mean, body. the body it's works just, how it's supposed to work. Yes. And so you just generally feel better when you've got lots of water in you. Yep, and you don't get the headaches. There's yes. The dehydration headaches are the worst. Yes, they are. So um, we've been carrying this or talking about this teacher strike story. You know, we, we talked about the teachers in Oklahoma at the end of last week. Yeah. Um, and two more, two more states are walking off the job. One of those is Oklahoma, um, and the other one is Kentucky. Now, a couple weeks ago or 10 days ago, it was West Virginia. Remember, yes. their teachers went on strike. Like the whole state, they all went on strike because they were – um, underpaid and and it's not only that they're underpaid because there were some people who were you know they added up uh, what teachers make you know based on the the t- working ten months instead of twelve and annualized it well they make really good money well the 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 challenge though is that how many how much do you spend on supplies for your classroom um, and and you, it's it's easy to annualize except that you've got to you've got to feed your family on what you get each month right yes and most teachers put money aside. Um, so they get paid t- 10 months. They, they have a percentage put aside so they don't starve during the summer. So, so my first year uh, when I was teaching, um, I did not know to put the money aside. And I did not get hired right at the beginning of the school year. So I was uh, like a month into the school year when I got hired. And there was some snafus with the first paycheck and other things. And we literally were living paycheck to paycheck back then. And come summertime, and no paycheck came. And so I ended up getting that first summer. I had three part-time jobs to try to put food on the table for our family. Yep. I was uh, waiting tables. Um, I was throwing newspapers. And I was tutoring some kids in the neighborhood um, to try to get extra money for our family. And it was scary. And at the end of the summer, we were literally searching change out in the couches, you know, 
and going to one of those Coinstar type machines to cash in the change so we could get the last couple of meals that we needed to make it through the last little bit of summer. Yep. I mean, it was scary and it was hard. It was hard. Um, now, I learned from that, right? I learned from that. And so the next year, we made some adjustments. Um, the district, uh, uh, I talked to the teachers and I put money in the uh, teacher's credit union, which would then take out a certain uh, one-twelfth uh, or two-twelfths of my, my paycheck. One-sixth. One-sixth, thank you. And they then kept that aside for me so that I could have two paychecks worth of money saved up for the summer. Um, and I did that for the first five years. And then eventually the district began to offer a 12-month pay plan, but they charge you for it. So if you wanted, the district would then give you instead of paying you 10 times a year, would then pay you 12 times a year, um, but they would then take a, a little service fee off on that because of the, the extra checks that they had to issue. and The uh, extra pay pay personnel to do the payroll and yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. And so um, so then I started getting the 12-month pay. But it, you know, it, it's fascinating. People don't understand how a lot of that works for teachers. And um, I remember when I first got hired as a teacher, one of the first conversations I had with your father who lives in Texas, which makes a little less for teachers in California. A lot less, actually. Sa said to me, um, are you and my daughter going to be on welfare? And I said, no, sir. Why would I be on welfare? And, you know, and we had a conversation, and I began to look into it and saw how much starting teachers made in Texas versus California, and they were below the poverty line. They were. And um, below the federal poverty line. And, you know, uh, and even though the cost of living there was cheaper, it, you couldn't live off of that, I don't think. And, um, so it was a legitimate question. He wasn't was. being a jerk. It, yeah, but the thing is is that there's a lot of states around the country that are still in that situation. And so, for instance, um, uh, the Oklahoma teachers, you know, in, in one of the articles I read about them, uh, you could work 10 years as a teacher and still not make $40,000 a year, right? Now, a starting teacher in California makes 40000 right? Yes. And, and so and I know the cost of livings are vastly different, and you can live on a lot less in Oklahoma, but... Regardless, I've seen video after video of these teachers in Oklahoma working, you know, three, four, five, six jobs. Yeah, one guy with six jobs. Yeah. And they never saw their own children. That was the thing. Uh huh. Um, you know, and somebody posted, because we posted about this on Facebook, and somebody posted, yeah, well, the, you know, the median income in Oklahoma is about 41000 Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, but, you know, they're taking uh, the what everyone earns, minimum wage earners, you know, mm -hmm. that's, it's... That's that's not a good um, comparison to figure out what teachers should be paid. It really isn't. No. You know, you have to look at that the the amount of education and the job that they're required to do, um, and you know, teachers are educated people. We're not talking about, uh, we're, you know, talking about living wage. We're not talking about people who who flip burgers. Not that there's anything wrong with flipping burgers, but it's an unskilled job. Yes. Teachers are highly educated. Many of them have master's degrees, and they all have a teaching credential in addition to their four-year degree. Um, and they all have to go through ongoing, you know, teacher education. I mean, it's this, this, this. Uh, they they have to get continuing education units um, yeah. uh, to continue with their credentials. Yeah, and so it's 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 really sad to see what's going on around the country. Um, I, I'm kind of proud of these teachers for standing up, um, and and I think a lot of what we're seeing is being sort of pushed in part because uh, there's this, the case that we've also talked about here on the radio, the Janus case, which is in front of the Supreme Court. Because once they make that ruling, which everyone is pretty confident they're going to do, which is going to make, basically make every state a right to work state, that you're going to see a, a significant number of people that have been union members leave the union and it's going to become much harder to organize these kinds of mass actions to get you know change there was one article where a a there and this actually came from the bbc um where the uh, teachers were talking about one teacher had 25 25 books for no 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 i'm sorry 15 books for 35 students so you know it or some other number like that i don't remember exactly the numbers but it was yeah. it was at least 15 fewer than she needed to for her classroom i don't have enough for my kids really yeah in my classroom we have class sets and, and this is by the way something that happened in the last decade because of of comparent complaints about the kids having to carry the heavy backpacks it used to be the kids carried the books back and i forth, remember i right? remember the insane backpacks yeah, yeah yeah and so parents complained about that and so now we have class sets but the class sets get destroyed. So I've had the textbooks that I'm using now for 11 years, okay? And over those 11 years, a significant number of those books have been destroyed to a point where they're unusable. And so in my seventh grade class, which I, I at the largest I could have 36 kids, I have 30 books. 
and and of those 30 probably a good 10 or 12 of them are in pretty bad shape like they've been torn up pretty bad and, and we're still using them because we need them but they're not in in great shape and now the good news is for history um that this is a book adoption year and we're actually going through the process of selecting the new textbooks and next year we will get all new textbooks for the history uh, classes uh, throughout California um, and and the problem is though is because of the recession what's normally a seven-year cycle got stretched out right, right. The, the state didn't have the money to buy all the textbooks and so they just said we'll just keep using those and and now that they've got money now that we're now we're back on the textbook cycle and so different different content areas are getting different books in different years and um, uh, you know I think English and math have already got theirs um, now we're doing history and then science will get theirs and um, uh, it's challenging though and if you don't have good books or you don't have enough books it's hard to teach you know um, I, I think about in California teachers can le live a comfortable life yeah you know I mean it's it's a it's um, uh, you're not gonna you're never gonna be rich but most teachers don't go at, most teachers are not motivated by money yeah what they want is enough money to be able to have their kids play softball um, maybe take a vacation to the next state, um, you know, once a year. Like, there doesn't have to be European vacations. Um, you know, have enough to be able to save for their kids to go to college and, you know, save for retirement. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, pretty basic stuff. Yeah. And, and if you want to um, earn additional money as a teacher, you have to take on some pretty significant extra duties. You know, you're going to become a coach, you know, for a, a sports team. And, you know, and that's, you know, if, if, you, if you're lucky, it's just a single season. But a lot of times they're, they're it becomes a year round thing. And, you, you know, you might get a, a couple thousand dollars more a year on your total paycheck for doing that. But you're going to put in a lot of hours to earn that. And I've had people, you know, uh, do the math on that. And it's, you know, <laughs> way less than minimum wage for those extra duties, you know, and when you look at what they're actually put, putting in time wise. Um, and so it's it's tough. I mean, you know. Is not a, you basically get the base pay and you know, and then there's the people who take on those extra duties and usually it's not about the money it's because they just have a real passion for that sport or that activity. Right, right. Because they did speech and debate in high school, so now they're going to coach the team. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. With that, it's time for a break. I'm Erin Brinker, and I'm Tobin Brinker, and we'll be right back. Bob Vila here with my home improvement tip of the day. Drilling into metal isn't all that difficult, but knowing a few basics before you start the job will make it go more smoothly. First, be sure to wear safety goggles, not glasses, when you're drilling into metal. They help keep any tiny flecks of metal from getting into your eyes. Use a vise or clamps to hold the metal in place. Before picking up your drill, use a center punch to create a small dimple where you're planning to drill. That'll keep your bit from drifting. The dimple doesn't need to be big, just large enough to keep the bit in place. As you drill, keep a little light motor oil in the hole to help with lubrication and to keep the bit from overheating. One more tip, don't try to rush the job by applying too much pressure on the drill and running it at top speed. You'll achieve better control and end up with a more accurate and cleaner cut if you use moderate pressure and keep the drill at half speed. Get more info at BobVila.com and right here at home with me, Bob Vila. This segment of programming sponsored by CyberTime Network Communications. How's your internet? Slower than what you were paying for? Feeling boxed in with the high cost of the internet? It can be frustrating and expensive, and with net neutrality coming, it's not getting any easier. Ready for a better high-speed internet service? Then you're ready for CyberTime. And they're local and right in your own backyard. CyberTime provides connectivity for all our transmissions you're listening to at KCAA. CyberTime is locally owned and will respond to your needs with the best service. It's Crisp, cool, fast, and sleek. CyberTime uses the latest leading edge microwave technology to be able to offer clients a safe, reliable, public or private network that fits almost any budget size. Numerous local city agencies rely on CyberTime's microwave private network for their most critical mission applications. You should too. Get connected, stay connected, get smart, get CyberTime. You can Google, text, or call CyberTime Network Communications at 909-795-9559. CyberTime Network Communications in Calum Mesa. For several days, you've been craving a juicy, tender steak. So, it's time to satisfy that craving at Tony's Spunky Steer Restaurant. Tony's is located in the Tri-City Shopping Center in Redlands. At Tony's, you'll have top-notch service and feast on some of the best-tasting prime sizzler steaks in the Inland Empire. 
The Tri-City Center is located just off I-10 between Alabama and the Tennessee exits in Redlands. Make Tony's Spunky Steer your dining destination for that special occasion, or if you just want a great steak. If you're looking for a full or part-time sales position and you have radio, TV, or print media experience, KCAA has a great opportunity waiting for you that pays the highest commissions in the market. KCAA is the only station in the IE that broadcasts on three frequencies, so advertisers receive three ads for one low rate. This makes KCAA a must-buy for every local business. If you're interested in a sales position with us, email CEO at KCAARadio.com. This is Dr. Mitch Gibson from The Mitch and Kathy Show. There's a lot of talk shows that give you a chance to air your opinions about politics. What about those other areas that you hold back on, such as those strange things that happen during sex? Join us and tell us all about these things that you really want to talk about. The Mitch and Kathy Show, every Tuesday, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or 3 to 5 p.m. Pack time on 1050 a.m., 106.5 f.m. or kcaaradio.com. K C A A. Welcome back. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. And another topic that we, besides education, that we talk about a lot or have talked about um, over the last few years is this issue of civil asset forfeiture. Take my stuff, please. Please take it. No, 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 don't take it. Don't take it. So there's an article in the Washington Post, um, uh, and this is from 2017, but uh, I think that it's, it's, it's um, I think we still need to talk about it. Yes. And I say this because it's still happening, because our Justice Department is in support of, of this practice, even though I am not. Yes. They don't, I don't get a vote. Um, the DAA, DEA, um, since in the 10 years between uh, 07 and 17, took $3.2 billion in cash from people not charged with a crime. So what civil asset forfeiture is, is all the, the police or any law enforcement agency has to do is say, well, I think that you might be, you, you might have acquired that um, illegally or you might be engaged in some illegal or nefarious uh, practices. And so the, the, the fruits of that labor, so to speak, um, now become property of the government. And so, yes. you know, it, and we, we talked about stories or people driving in East Texas was a particularly um, tough spot for this. You know, a family would be driving with their life savings because they're going to go buy, I don't know, a horse or something. And the, the cops help themselves to it. And there's really no recourse at yeah. all. Yeah. And, um, you know, this this process is so clearly unconstitutional, in my opinion, right? I mean, we have a, a right to life, liberty, and property, and um, this this taking, you know, it's an illegal search and seizure, in my opinion, right? How and, could it not be? Because there's literally zero due process. Yes, and it's a second-level crime, right? It's like, the it, it, even, if, even if they're taking stuff off the criminals— you know, it's it's the government profiting sort of secondarily from the crime that the criminals committed. You, you know what I mean? Yes. It, it's so crime pays. I mean, this is this is the this is the irony of it. Right. Well, and police departments depend on those dollars. They do. And I, I just uh, I think this whole thing is just so wrong. There's it actually creates an incentive for our police officers to do things that they should not be doing. You know? Yes. So in, in 2017, uh, uh, Attorney General Jeff Ses Sessions announced that the Justice Department would increase the federal use of civil asset forfeiture, um, and that, that allows uh, law enforcement to seize property. Uh, civil asset forfeiture is a key tool, he said. President Trump has directed this Department of Justice to reduce crime in this country, and we will use every lawful tool that we have to do that. Um, 
now Justice Clarence Thomas uh, uh, said in a statement that no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. And you know the bizarre thing about an illegal th- if, if the kinds of if there's a legal case brought, it's the item. So say they yes. say they um, seized a vehicle, a car. Mm-hmm. Um, the the car is the one who has standing to sue. No, that not the no person. Sense. It's the dumbest thing in the so, world. So, so here's the actual quote from Justice Thomas, and I love this guy for the way he says this. Uh, this was in the case Leonard v. Texas, and he says, um, not only has civil asset forfeiture led to egregious and well-chronicled abuses by law enforcement agencies around the country, but the practice is fundamentally incompatible with the Constitution. Um, and I, I think that um, you know, that is about as clear as you can be. you know, um, And... Uh, uh, I hope that this stuff gets knocked down. I hope the courts really stand up on this issue. Um, Thomas did not mince words. He says the legal justifications offered in defense of civil asset forfeiture, he pointed out, cannot be squared with the text of the Constitution, which would, which presumably would require the Supreme Court to align its uh, distinct doctrine governing civil, civil forfeiture with doctrines governing other forms of punitive state actions and property deprivation. Uh, those other doctrines, Thomas noted, impose significant checks on the government, such as heightened standards of proof, numerous procedural safeguards, and the right to a trial by jury. And this is the problem. These folks who have their stuff taken, in many instances, uh, never went in front of a judge, never uh, went in front of a jury, There's never had any evidence presented against them. Um, they were simply arrested, their stuff was taken, and then they were released later and their stuff was not given back. Right. Um, and, and I know here in California... Um, one of the, the most egregious forms of this was uh, they would pull drivers o- over. They would create a checkpoint, uh, presumably to stop drunk drivers. But what they were getting mostly were people who were driving without a driver's license. And then they would seize their car. California law allowed them to seize their car. And it would be taken to an impound yard um, where it would be held. And the fees, the daily fees of the impound yard, rack up so quickly, right? And they hold your car for a month under the law, Okay. So in a month, when you can finally go get your car back, the, the cost of the fees to get your car out of the impound yard, in, in many instances, exceed what people can afford or exceed the value of the car. And so people then don't get their cars out. They don't try to spend all that money to get their car out. And then the uh, owner of the impound yard then sells the car. Now, here's what was really shady about a lot of this. Uh, the police officers who impounded these cars would then create a list in some instances, of the cars they liked. And they would uh, create side deals with these, uh, the, the impound yards. And when that car came up for sale, they would make sure that they were the, the winning bidder, right? And get these cars for pennies on the dollar. And then they'd either keep them or sell them off and keep the money. Uh, and, and so there was just a real racket that was going on here around civil asset forfeiture uh, in cars in California. And the state has since changed some of the rules on that so they can't take people's cars like that. But it is... It was just heartbreaking as you watch people losing, in many instances, your most valuable possession, your car. Here's the other thing. Let's just say for the sake of argument that the, that the people uh, who, who had the seizure, whose, whose assets were seized, really were involved with criminal activity, right? You think that those assets would go back to the person who was wronged, the mm-hmm. person who was the victim of the fraud, the person who had their, their goods stolen by, yes. by the by the person who's, you know, there's a third party victim here, or actually, you know, the first victim. Yes. They don't get their stuff back either. No. The, 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 the police department or the DEA or whoever does the seizure gets to keep those, those uh, uh, items. Yeah. So even if, if the, uh, the, if you, let's say, took money off of a drug lord, right? You caught someone who's running a drug operation. Then all of that money and all the stuff that you got from that should be put into uh, drug rehab or, you know what I mean? It should go to something. But, but even then, you only get to keep the money, in my opinion, if the person was convicted of the crime. Yes. If, or if you, if you were, say you committed fraud, you had a fraud ring, maybe yep. you were doing a pyramid scheme, maybe yep. you were doing something like that, um, and then the, the government came in and seized your assets. Those assets don't go back to the people who were victimized. Yeah. Those assets don't go back to uh, the victims of, those fr- of that fraud necessarily. Yeah. So, so this, this civil asset forfeiture is one of the things I'm not liking about uh, Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration. No. Uh, I didn't like it under Obama. I didn't like it under Bush. I think it's a bad policy. I think it's unconstitutional, and I hope that uh, the courts step up and slam all this stuff down. And I'm, and I'm glad as states begin to look at this and, and 
smart, good-minded, good people are starting to step up and, and repeal some of these laws because it's just wrong. The problem is they've gotten addicted to the money. They have. Because it's, it's, it's lucrative for them. Yep. Um, and this is still an issue. And I know this article, and I, I mentioned the article is a little bit older, um, but uh, uh, there are still articles, and I'm going to post one on our, our KCAA uh, Morning Show Facebook page. Um, the government really can seize your assets and take, and take ownership. Yeah. Um, and this is from a, a, a law office, and I will, I will post. It's from March 23rd, um, and I will post that so you can see that it's still going on. This is something, if you're going to talk to your legislators, talk to them about this. Right. All right. So now it's time for a break. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA. We'll be right back. KCAA Loma Linda, 1050 AM, K292 FQ Riverside, and K293 CF Moreno Valley. NBC News Radio. I'm Lisa Carter. President Trump is calling for a caravan of Central American migrants to be stopped before reaching the U.S. border. Trump tweeting this morning, the big caravan of people from Honduras now coming across Mexico and heading to our weak laws border had better be stopped before it gets here. He said cash cow NAFTA is in play, as is foreign aid to Honduras and the countries that allow this to happen. The walkout continues for Oklahoma teachers. Thousands walked out yesterday to call for more funding for education and higher salaries. Many students turned out in support. It's not only the teachers fighting for themselves, and, it, and it's the students backing them. Educators will be back at the state capitol in Oklahoma City today for more rallies and picketing. And classes canceled today on the campus of Villanova University after the Wildcats beat Michigan 79-62 to last night to claim their second NCAA men's basketball title in three seasons. Lisa Carter, NBC News Radio. The Villanova Wildcats are again champions of men's college basketball. The top-seeded Cats cruising past third-seeded Michigan 79-62 in the national title game in San Antonio. Nova head coach Jay Wright. feels so uh, blessed that, that we're put in this position to have each other, have guys like this to play with. Nova claims its second title in three seasons, third overall. Dante DiVincenzo, the most outstanding player in the Final Four after the Wildcats guard poured in a career-high 31 points off the bench in the title win. I did not think that I was going to have this kind of night because every night I come into the game, I just try to bring energy. I try to defend. I try to rebound. With the regular season winding down in the NBA, some teams thinking playoffs, some thinking ping pong balls. Michigan State University's Jaron Jackson Jr., the latest to enter the NBA draft, announcing his decision Monday on social media. The six foot eleven big man widely expected to be a lottery pick. He joins Miles Bridges as players leaving MSU early to turn pro. That's sports, Jake Warwin, NBC News Radio. It's time for traffic on KCAA. I'm Erin Brinker. In Riverside, on the 215 northbound at Box Springs Road, there's an accident. there was an accident there that's been cleared, but there's still stop-and-go traffic backed up from Cactus Avenue. The 60 west is slow and go from Heacock to the 215. In Ontario, on the 15 southbound at Harupa, a crash is now along the right shoulder. This has been your traffic on KCAA. We are the stations that leave. No listener behind. I'm Erin Brinker. From the KCAA Weather Center, I'm Rod Tanner. For this morning, we'll have patchy fog. Mostly cloudy skies will gradually it'll become sunny with a high of 78 with winds to 20 miles an hour. Overnight, it'll be clear with a low of 52. We'll have a sunny, breezy Wednesday with a high of 81 with a winds to 20 miles an hour. It'll be clear Wednesday night at a low of 54. We'll have a mostly sunny Thursday with a high of 78. Friday, we'll have a mix of sun and clouds at a high of 78. I'm Rod Tanner broadcasting live from the Tri-City Center with the 10 and 210 freeways. We are the trifecta of talk in Southern California, KCAA, 102.3 FM Riverside, 106.5 FM Redlands, and the Legacy, 1050 AM, Loma Linda, San Bernardino. KCAA, where every day is a great day. Someone else, but not for me. Our love was out to get me. And that's the way it seemed. Disappointment haunted all my dreams. Then I saw her face. Now I'm a 
Welcome back. I'm Marion Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are On the Brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. So excited to welcome back to the show Stuart Hanif. He is the Development Director for Feeding America, serving Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And they have a push. They're looking for volunteers. Stuart, welcome to the show. Good morning, Aaron and, and Tobin. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to speak with you again. So, uh, so t- first of all, tell us uh, what's going on at the, at the food bank right now. Well, this is always uh, an exciting time. You know, we always talk about hunger, un- unfortunately, not being seasonal. Um, we have been on many months, and we've had conversations about how during the holidays, hunger seems to be in the forefront of everyone's mind. People are in a generous, um, thankful, giving mood. But uh, we feed 425,000 people, that's families, children, seniors, veterans, every single month. And the problem when we start a new year and when we're in the spring of the new year, like right now, is hunger is not necessarily on the minds of everyone, but those 425,000 and actually more than that, 800,000 that are in need, they're still hungry. And we're still um, here trying to feed them. So perfect that I'm here in April to talk with you at the beginning of this new month, because for those of you that don't know, April is National Volunteer Month in the United States. So this is a big focus, um, especially uh, during April, because the month is dedicated to honoring all volunteers in our communities, as well as encouraging volunteerism throughout the month. And volunteers are such a huge part of what we do. I've mentioned before to both of you that 98 cents, 98 percent of every donation goes directly to feeding people. I mean, you're not going to find a greater multiplier than that. One cent goes to administration, one cent goes to fundraising. The reason we can run so efficiently is because of our volunteers that we have. We had over 5,000 hours last year, and I didn't know this until I started working with Feeding America, but the value of one volunteer hour in the state of California Are you ready for this? It's over $27. Wow. You think about $27 times 5,000 and the true impact of what volunteers do. They can come to our food bank Monday through Friday and on select Saturdays during the month, and they can pack and sort food. But I have always said it's more than just packing food. It's packing hope because the next person who touches that box or that food, you don't know how long it's been since they've eaten. You don't know if they've eaten, and you have a direct opportunity to change that, to impact that. And we have all kinds of volunteers. We have family volunteers on Saturdays. We have corporate, churches, schools, sororities and fraternities, um, service clubs. Um, It's a great opportunity to team build and to have a direct impact in the community because all of that food that our volunteers pack and sort stays directly right here in our community. Wow. So, so say I, I want to do a, a, a corporate give back event. Um, what is the process for getting signed up? Absolutely. Well, we have a fantastic um, volunteer coordinator, our development coordinator, Sharon, and you can call um, our food bank at 951-359-4757 and ask to speak to Sharon. Or even easier, you can go online to our website, www.feedingie, like Inland Empire, org and you can sign up online um, there's a volunteer uh, application to sign up and it's very easy it's very seamless and uh, you'll be in our system and you can come out with your company as I said with your family and friends um, it's a really great um, opportunity to um, bond and to really help the community and this is we're really excited about this because we're expanding our volunteer opportunities the end of this month in in um, conjunction with Earth Day We're going to have our very first clean and glean event at the historical Citrus Park in Riverside. So our volunteers are actually going to come to the Citrus Park, and they're going to collect um, oranges and citrus that we can use for our kids' produce markets, which are farmer's markets we do in the high-need, low-income elementary schools. So we're actually cultivating and capturing citrus right here from our community thanks to our volunteers that children in our elementary schools will benefit from directly right here in our area. Now, what if I want to volunteer more often, maybe do two hours a week or something? How does it, can I do that? Absolutely. I mean, we, we have a high demand for volunteers, especially during the week. 
you know, Saturday volunteers are limited, the volunteer opportunities on Saturdays, and they tend to fill up the fastest. But we have two shifts on Monday through Friday. We have a morning shift uh, from 8 until 11.30, and then we have an afternoon shift from 12.30 until 3.30. So we encourage people to come as much as they would like and come as often as possible. We need all the help that we can get, and all of that is working towards our mission of alleviating hunger in the Inland Empire. So where do people get more information uh, about uh, Feeding America in the Inland Empire? Absolutely. Visit our website, which again is www.feedingieinlandempire.org. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, too, we have a program that we're focusing on to really try to build and grow, and that's our monthly program for giving. It's so easy because, you know, $1 provides enough food for nine meals. Think wow. about that. Where can we go where a dollar even provides one meal? One dollar is enough for nine meals. You can sign up online, be a monthly giver, and your gift and your support will have um, an impact and be able to sustain our neighbors in need all year long. And think about this, just $10 a month, which is like, what, one or two Starbucks um, or a latte, um, $10 a month is enough um, to feed a family of four for three months. So if you sign up and become a monthly donor, you can feed families. And there's, it's never been easier, and it has such a huge impact. Wow, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of the incredible work that you do. And you'll be joining us again at the end of next week on Friday. We were on vacation when it was during your regular time last uh, uh, this past month, and now we're, we're back, and we look forward to talking to you again next week. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. We were, we've been talking to Stuart Hanna. He is the uh, development director for Feeding America in the Inland Empire. Go check it out. Um, you know, go volunteer. It's seriously, you'll make friends. It'll be exciting and fun. You need to. T- you need to go do that. All right. So it's time for a break. I'm Aaron Brinker, and I'm Tobin Brinker, and we'll be right back. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Oh. Knuckles, cracking. You may not mind the sound, you may despise it, or you could study it. A couple years back, Vinny Sujo was taking a biomechanics class at the French Polytechnic School outside Paris, and he was on the hunt for the perfect class project. Even though they suggested many projects, I couldn't find one which is both practical and that I could complete within the framework of this class. So in frustration, I was cracking my knuckles one day, and that's when I realized, huh, that's interesting. And so a project was born, the physics of knuckle cracking. It's actually a subject of intense scientific investigation. Back in 1971, scientists figured they knew how it worked. The cracking sound was caused by bubbles popping within the fluid surrounding the knuckles. Or so they thought, because in 2015, shots were fired in the form of MRI visualization of the knuckles post-cracking. In fact, the bubbles were still there. The whole process happens too fast for imaging technology to visualize in real time. You'd need to shoot at 1,200 frames per second, 10 times faster than the best X-ray and MRI machines on the market. And that's when we realized that our model could help people better understand the origin of this sound. So, using mathematical models, Suja and his colleague Abdul Barakat found that just a partial collapse of the bubbles could cause cracking sounds of the same degree, which might explain why the 2015 researchers still saw bubbles after the crack. The details are in the journal Scientific Reports. Further modeling of bubble behavior, both pre- and post-pop, will be needed, they say, before they're confident that they've truly cracked the case. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. It's time to make the Tri-City Center in Redlands a regular part of your weekly shopping experience. Tri-City is home to a wide assortment of quality businesses, including the all-new Ocean Aquatics. Check out their variety of exotic tropical fish, along with fish food, accessories, and tanks of all shapes and sizes. The Tri-City Center is located just off of Alabama in the Tennessee exits in Redlands. Visit the Tri-City Center today and find out why it's called the Mall with a Heart. 
KCAA invites you to join Dr. Donald Gabriel Jolly for What's It All About? He's never without words. I have an opinion about everything. He talks about everything. You can say I love you and be fired by the power of the crotch instead of the real meaning of love. You have an illness. It is called terminal acute Hornitis. Join Dr. Jolly for What's It All About? 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon on KCAA 1050 AM. Broadcasting more local radio programs than any other station in California. We are KCAA. Some people call me the Space Cowboy. Yeah. Some call me the Gangster of Love. Welcome back. I'm Erin Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the brink, the morning show on KCAA, AM 1050, FM 106.5 and FM 102.3. Want to remind everybody all the ways you can uh, follow us on social media. I am Erin Hunt Brinker on Facebook. Tobin is Tobin Brinker on Facebook. Tobin is Tobin Brinker on Instagram and Twitter as well. I am Erin Brinker on Instagram and at Erin Songbird on Twitter. And surprisingly, in real life, I'm not actually Tobin Brinker. I'm just someone else. Really? I'm just playing with you. Well, you know, the, the, the letters that we get um, from the development department at Loma Linda University <laughs> call you Jobin Brinker. Jobin. I'm with, Jobin with a J. Jobin with a J. That's right. <laughs> so, um, uh, opponents of the large-scale Harmony housing development in Highland are expected to make their case against the project in court this week. Uh, a hearing is set for Friday, April 6th. Uh, uh, filed in September 2016 by the Center for Biological Diversity, the San, Ber San Bernardino Valley Audubon Society and the Green Spot Residents Association, there's lawsuit aims to pause or even stop the master plan community outside of Highland. Opponents claim the project violates the county California Environmental Quality Act and will have a significant impact on air pollution and flooding. The project, led by Upland-based developer Lewis Group of Companies, would bring more than 3,600 homes and additional amenities, such as a fire station and trails, to 1,657 acres of land north of Mill Creek, south and west of the San Bernardino National Forest, and east of Greenspot Road. The suit claims the project's location on the remote outskirts of Highland mean the 12,000 future Harmony residents who will need to drive daily to jobs in, in the city center or beyond will add hundreds of thousands of vehicle miles per year, resulting in emissions in excess of regional targets. In court documents, the city says the final environmental impact report fully complies with requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, and the suit's conclusions fail to overcome the substantial evidence in the record. Wow. Yes. So we talked about this and actually had some folks on um, from the, the community group that was opposing this Harmony um, housing development in Highland. And so it continues to move forward. So um, the, the lawsuit backers will hold a community meeting on the 6th, uh, at 6 p.m. on Monday, April Oh, that was Monday, April 2nd. That was yesterday at Mentown Moose Lodge. But, the, but the, um, the hearing is set for April 6th. So I think there's still time uh, if you want to uh, weigh in. You, there's still time uh, to get your opinion heard. Yeah, you know, it, it's a fascinating discussion. I mean, in the larger sense, you know, California doesn't have enough houses, and that's why housing prices are, are so high and, and people are struggling to find housing. But on the other hand, if you're the person who lives in that specific area where all those houses are going in and you have to put up with all of the impact of it, uh, it, it becomes very clear that this is, is maybe not the, the best location or the best place. But, you know, uh, California's got to do something, right? I mean, it's... it's we it's don't have best. enough homes. Yeah. And uh, we see other places where they're putting in sort of large developments like this and, and people get frustrated, you know? I know that uh, the city of Grand Terrace is a little concerned because Highgrove, uh, right next to Grand Terrace, Highgrove's in the Riverside County side of the line, um, is putting in a bunch of houses. But you know that most of those folks are going to be coming into Grand Terrace for services. So Riverside gets the taxes from the new development, and Grand Terrace gets the, 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 uh, the costs associated with the road wear, wear and tear and all the other stuff. And, and so, you know, th this, these are challenging issues. 
Um, also, if you've been through South Riverside County, uh, you you see or, or Corona, which is part of part of that, uh, you see the impact of having all of a sudden you have all these cars, additional cars yep. on the roadway, and you know you hear me read the traffic here on the on KCAA. The areas that have had all of this growth are the ones where there's the most uh, traffic, the, the the greatest number of traffic incidents. Yeah, and oftentimes when they make these uh, uh, developments, they're not thinking about the the larger impact to the area. You know, so they make roads that are big enough for the folks that are going to live on those specific streets. But when you start adding all that traffic as they're going to and from work and to and from school and all the other, you know, places that people go, th everything else isn't really built up for it. And those things cost money too. You know, it's interesting, and and I'm not against growth, but these yeah. are things that have to be that you have to think about. We uh, we were in one side of Corona where where t our Tobin's brother Todd lives uh, with his family, and uh, we wanted to go to lunch on the other side of Corona. It took 25 minutes, and yes. it was five miles, six miles. Yeah, and and yeah, the freeways were bad, the side streets were bad. There was not a good, there was no really good alternatives because. They just hadn't built in the infrastructure for all that, the extra people that live there now. So these are not easy questions because we do want the beautiful homes. We do want the nice development. I mean, it's, you know, so that's not, they're yeah. not the enemy, but let's, it, it has to be thought out. It has to be, you know, there has to be rational discussion around this. Yeah. So um, we'll keep you posted on what happens from that meeting. Um now, Jared Fogel. Remember Jared Fogel? I do, the he, pedophile. The subway guy. Yes, the pedophile. And I'm sure subway... To, <laughs> they, they hate that I say the subway guy. Yeah, I know, right? So, They're like, uh, no, we don't, we don't remember him. He's uh, not part of our organization. Yes, he's a fat guy who lost weight. That's all I know. <laughs> so uh, Jared Fogel's odd, latest odd move after being sent to prison for 15 years on a child porn conviction, he's suing the judges and prosecutors who sent him there crazy is that a thing you uh, can do that no, i don't think i it's gonna get thrown out. i've got to think this is going to be thrown out aaron I, this is it sounds crazy to me so this is according to tmz fogel who has teamed up with two other inmates to file the civil suit wants are you ready for this 57 million dollars from judges and prosecutors he's suing claiming he was unjustly charged with conspiracy to receive pictures of minors Really? Yeah. Well, apparently in previous attempts to free himself from prison, uh, Fogel had argued that the conspiracy charge does not apply to his crime. Uh, last week, Fogel also made another attempt to get himself freed, filing paperwork and seeking a writ of habeas corpus from the federal court in Denver. But he listed President Trump as a defendant and a judge giving him 30 days to revise the paperwork, among other things. He needs to remove Trump and his sentencing job, judge as defendants. This is, ju this is just wackadoo stuff, right? So this, this is reminds just me, like his lawyer is Elle Woods before she was, you know, in her second year of law school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. You know, for those of you who don't know, habeas corpus is the idea that you can't be thrown in jail without actually having a crime and a conviction, right? And this is why when they arrest you, they have a certain period of time in which they have to get you in front of a judge to get a, a, a plea, right? Um, and we have, we have a variety of safeguards so that you don't just get locked up without actually having a conviction. Well, he's been convicted. See, there's no writ of habeas corpus. You can't demand to be let out of jail because you're being held detained without having actually had a trial and conviction. He had the trial. He had the conviction. Yeah. There's no habeas corpus. <laughs> God. Well, and if, here, he, think about this on a broader. For, first, he's crazy. Yes. But the, but think about this on a broader scale. If you know, if uh, if people could sue their judges. Yeah. I mean, there'd be the, the the legal system would be so clogged with those ridiculous lawsuits. Yes. Suing President Trump. Trump wasn't even president when Jared Fogel was convicted. No. Or when he was lo well, or when he was losing the weight. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, eating Subway. <laughs> I wonder if they serve Subway in jail. <laughs> What's he doing? Is he getting fat again? Maybe because oh he's. God. I'm sure he's sedentary in there. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe all he's doing is push-ups and pull-ups. When he's going to come out like one of those buff prison guys with the tats. Well, and here's the thing: because in prison you need protection, right? I mean, yeah. and it's all about. From what I understand, I've never been there, but from what I understand, it's all about race, right? Yeah. So, has he joined the Aryan Brotherhood in prison? I don't know. Well, and he's got. He's got to obviously be like isolated because of the crimes that he committed, and because he's such a high-profile person. I suspect there's got to be a target on him. Um, at prison for someone like him. I mean, prisons. 
is should be and is I think uh, a, a really hellish place. But for someone like him, I think it's got to be particularly challenging. Um, but these crazy lawsuits, my goodness. So from the from the 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 population that gave you Tide Pods for lunch, we now have a, a controversy, and I didn't send this to you. Mm -hmm. um, of uh, it's called the condom challenge. Okay. S teenagers are snorting condoms and then pulling them out their their the back of their mouth. So like up one in up up the nose and out the mouth. That's disgusting. Yeah, I just don't understand why. And, why would you do that? Well, first off, there's so much danger associated with that. I mean, if it goes down your throat, y you could suffocate and die. Yeah. Right. Yes. So why? Oh my God. So yeah. These kids are so dumb. <laughs> They're so dumb. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. They are so dumb. I I don't know what else to say. I mean, do we put? Uh, are these Darwin Award? hopefuls i i don't know what they're why so, they're doing so, this you know when we were kids like if you wanted to like show that you had some weird skill or whatever you take like the stem off of a cherry and you pop it in your mouth and you tie it into a little knot you know with your tongue or some such thing and that was your thing right that was i mean and that's kind of your bizarre little thing and i could see people doing that but uh snorting condoms up your nose and spitting them out gross yeah it's just it's gross on so many levels oh, i, I don't goodness. know what else to say except don't do that you idiot and don't eat Tide Pods either, moron. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're not four or two. So with that, we are at the end of our show for today. I'm Erin Breaker. And I'm Tobin Breaker. Have a great day, everybody. And we'll be back tomorrow.